Biobalance HealthCast, Episode 112, The Writing of Testosterone, the Secret Female Hormone. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging, covering treatment and solutions that include bioidentical hormone pellet therapy, safe and affordable skin rejuvenation, and spa quality botanical skincare. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health, and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Today we're having a conversation. It's uh, our final podcast of the year, and we are excited because in the next year we, we've signed a contract with a publisher to publish our book, and we thought we'd spend some time today talking about how we got to this place. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy and I first started talking about writing a book. Kathy was talking about writing her book. We met a couple years back when we discovered that we had clients in common. I had some clients that I was seeing for therapy who were seeing Kathy for some medical issues. And in her conversations with them, she made the connection and got permission to speak to me. And we began to talk about ways and, and, and places where our approaches overlapped or our concerns overlapped. And as a result of those conversations, you started to tell me about this idea that you had to write your book and that you've been working and, on yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, I sat down and I said, I have, I believe that I've, <laughs> I can't, I can remember his face exactly. I said, I, it was like I had just had a psychiatric break. <laughs> I said, I believe I'm supposed to write a book about testosterone and hormones for women, bioidentical hormones, how important it is to their lives how it's going to change their lives and therefore as people start joining this group who replace their hormones build a productive older age group in our society i mean he looked at me like you have just lost it i'm leaving the room and well and, well you have to said, realize can, in my I business i sometimes it. speak with people that have visions <laughs> And when Kathy starts talking about this vision of this book, it I wasn't, wasn't sure exactly where it was yet. That yeah. kind of vision. Yeah. It was kind of a I know it's supposed to happen. It was kind of more of a, a calling than a vision. Uh -huh. But but I could see the steps that would lead to it and I could see it all coming to fruition. And you know, everybody wants to write a book. Yeah. Well, it wasn't about writing a book, it was about communicating and the only way where people really pay attention is books. Yeah. Even though we say, Oh, we're gonna put them on our iPad or we don't, you know, we're not going to carry a book around. People still do. And book, the book, a book about an important social change or a medical, actually a medical mm -hmm. um, treatment that might change how women feel and act. That was actually what I was trying to bring about through a book. But I'm not a writer. So that was the, that was the catch. I'd never written anything like a book. Well, and part of the challenge, I mean, you're more of a writer now than you were, and you yeah. may have been more of a writer than you thought you were, uh, but part of the challenge is you're so fragmented mm -hmm. with all of the many things that you do and the time commitments that you have. And so when you would try to sit down and write, you would constantly be, be interrupted mm -hmm. by force messages that would intercede. Here's mm -hmm. some new information. Here's a new test. You know, is this stuff outdated? These people need my attention. By, by research. By, I mean, re by, by yeah. things, new things that were coming out so I could never finish a chapter because then I'd have to incorporate all the new information and then I could never get on to the next chapter. Yeah, when so, you're just talking to somebody, you can say, yeah, but, you know, and you can go back. But when you've written it, it you leave it and it stands alone. And so mm -hmm. to be current, to be topical, mm -hmm was a challenge, but, but there were challenges for you of structure and time. Oh, absolutely, because so, I tried to write this book years before I met Brett, and I had all kinds of chapters started or finished or in the middle, right. but every time I'd sit down, the beeper would go off, I'd have to deliver a baby, I'd have to do surgery, I, and those were the days, all those years, that I was trying to do both, be hey. a hormone queen <laughs> and be an OBGYN. So when I stopped doing OBGYN two years ago, that's when I knew I could schedule time in. Yes. And then the issue was where? And there's no place that my staff and my patients really can't find me in, in an emergency or even in a non-emergency. So I didn't want to be interrupted. I couldn't think. So we had to 
find an office like this where we do our podcast mm -hmm. and write so that we wouldn't be interrupted. We don't have faxes, we don't have phones. We, I mean, our mobile We don't phones. have internet service. We, yeah. it's, we're pretty isolated in, in a purpose. bunker under a hill somewhere. Yeah, on purpose, just and no noise. So we had to have all those things. We found a space that we could use. And so, I mean, it wasn't just like, oh yeah, I think I'll write a book. It was like, we have to have everything set up so we have time. And plus, you made me be there at eight o'clock and, you know, write for a certain number of hours. And, and so that was your teaching. Yeah. The teaching part of you, the teacher, I had to be on time, which I'm hardly ever on time because something well, always happens. Well, you know, it, it's funny how things evolve because initially you asked me to write a chapter for the book that you were yeah, writing. That's true. And the chapter that she wanted me to write was a chapter about uh, when marriages have existed for some period of time and people have settled in, they've fallen out of lust and into love and then into boredom. Uh, <laughs> there are sometimes factors that are included in that that are physiological and health-based. Right. And, and when there has been an imbalance of sexual desire or sexual functioning and the marriage has stayed together, it's stayed together because people make accommodations. And sometimes there are hurt feelings and sometimes there is woundedness. There are compensatory strategies that people develop. And then if they come to you and they get the physiological issues resolved and their bodies kind of reset to where maybe they were earlier in the marriage, mm -hmm. the patterns and rhythms of cueing and signaling and responding have, have not changed. So right. I come home and I'm all perky, but I don't know how to signal that to you and get your attention. So. Kathy asked me to, to write a book about what happens, what adjustments need to occur, what do people need to be sensitive about, and so on. So I wrote that chapter, and she read it, and she liked it, and she said, how come my chapters don't read like this? <laughs> <laughs> I said, whatever do you mean? So, <laughs> so she gave me some of her chapters, and they didn't read the same way. There are, there's such a volume of data that's yeah. truly just trigger point data for Kathy. If you ask her a question about a hormone, a medicine, a drug interaction, a patient history, a blood test, whatever, you get way more information than you can process <laughs> immediately. Now my patients don't. When I'm in the office, but I know But when you it, start trying to put it down on paper. Right, because it has to do with trying to appeal to every patient. And cover all the bases. Instead of appeal to that person right in front of me, I try to talk to people from how they learn, if they're visual, if they're auditory, if they're, if they have to see me draw a, a picture because that's going to make them remember what we're talking about. So I can hone down all my information oh, she does in too. front of a patient and for that particular person. But when I have to say, oh, every patient I've ever seen has to hear the right information, right. see it, hear it, feel it, and then act on it and take it into their it's overwhelming. informational system, I was trying to do every piece of information that was in my brain, right. which is a problem. That doesn't read well. And so we had to like slash it. Which is very similar to what I would teach people to do who were in training to be therapists. The, one of the risks for therapists is that they get lost in the story. And if, mm -hmm. I, if you come in to talk to me about something and I get lost in the story, I don't have a place to stand to see the perspective. And, and good therapists learn how to walk back and forth. They, they hear the story, but they also stand and observe. So what we... Doctors do that too. But you didn't do it when you wrote. You no, may I do it when, when you I are with yeah. a patient because then you're in a different zone. Mm -hmm. But when you would come here and you would try to write and you would do what you were just describing with me, you'd give me, you'd draw diagrams and you'd whip through files and you'd stack folders on the desk <laughs> and hear some articles and, and look at all this stuff. And oh, it's then so you would now. tell me what the nugget or the gist of it was. And what we, not that it was dictation, it was, it was collaborative, but what we learned to do is we'd spend an hour talking about that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I would write a, a, a rough draft of what I had heard you say. Mm -hmm. And then you would go through it with an editor's pencil and say, no, that's wrong, that's wrong. You didn't hear that right. I need to explain that more. And we would go back and forth through two or three iterations of that mm -hmm. to get uh, a, a, a segment that was readable. I've, th just, just for an example, I've always done things I was good at naturally, mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. If I was good at something, that's what I, that's where I headed in my life. Yeah. Because I was good at it, and like, 
diagnosis is deductive reasoning. It's like all those mystery stories I read about, you know, Sherlock Holmes and all of those mysteries and all those TV shows yeah. and m movies I watched all were about finding the answer, which is diagnostic skills. You could have started in house. Yeah, I could actually have Except probably, you're much more I probably polite could and have, nice. and I wouldn't yeah. have lost my license like he should have. Yeah, anyway, no he, he's just, oh. Anyway, I don't really want to be compared to him. However, I do like the mystery of mm -hmm. the show. Mm -hmm. so, so that's my gift. My gift is not writing. So I had to go into an entirely different field and have somebody who felt comfortable with it, which is you, look through it and say, oh, patients aren't going to want to read that. You should have seen my nurses when I was... <laughs> Oh my gosh, I took the science chapter, yeah. the chapter about all the hormones, all the, all the science of the hormones, and I mean that chapter was long and I, even I thought it was tedious. I, I can attest to that. And I, and I handed what I thought was the finished product to my yeah. nurses and we were driving to Kansas City to our office there and they're like silent as they're reading it in we the back the seat. We say the silence was deafening. It was deafening. <laughs> And then, you know, Susie is so sweet. She can, you know, she can tell you that mm -hmm. you look like hell without making you feel that way. Yeah. Like, not making you feel bad, you know, but making you go, Like you my know, wife says, comb oh, your are, hair. are you going to wear that today? Well, she doesn't, yeah, well, that's not exactly, <laughs> Susie, yeah. Susie's like, that would be a great outfit if you yeah. were going to blank. Yeah, But 50's could you party. try something else for today? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So she looked at me, she goes, no one is going to get this. Yeah. I get it. Other doctors would get it, yeah. nurses get it, but the science part I couldn't figure out how to translate because it's not something I talk about every day. You don't have to tell someone the science of exactly what's behind their problem to tell them how to fix it. And they don't want to know the science in general. And they don't need to know it. And most of them don't want to know it. But, but you want to have do. a reference where they can find it. Yeah. And, and, and so that led to some of the challenges for writing the book. The technical decisions have to be made. And one of the technical decisions is, uh, in the beginning, are we writing this book to inform and persuade physicians mm -hmm. or are we writing this book to inform and persuade women mm -hmm. who can then go and talk to their physician and say, wait a minute, I, I've read this or I've heard that or I have these symptoms. Talk to me about this. Changes for women in America have always been grassroots. Yes. They've always been from the women themselves. And so we couldn't make change be in other ways, the way men make changes, because we were never until maybe now in the in the driver's seat. Right. We had to use grassroots kind of kind of approach to a problem. So the suffragettes and people I mean, right. that's how women have gotten what we need. And right. what we need right now is to not be discarded after we're forty and not be thrown away because we're old or being told to live with it. We can't in America survive that. Right. Because we have all the experience, we have all of the energy that we used to have all the energy yeah. that we put into our businesses, into our families, into our, into our husbands, into our greater families like our parents. And then all of a sudden, everybody's kind of off on their own. And now we have time to spend on society mm -hmm. and individual people who need our help. And if all of us disappear because we have lost our hormones, we disappear inwardly right. we disappear externally it's like we fading lose away. we lose our spirit we lose our drive we lose mm -hmm. everything if we don't have one hormone mm -hmm. and that's testosterone and no one tells us about that mm -hmm. so it is imperative that this book give women the feeling that they are empowered to be the suffragette of hormones it is not scary we are scared by the FDA and other studies who don't want us to do this as long as we live, we live longer, we live we live longer in society, but the, our value is considered by society to be lower than men. Mm -hmm. it, they, the people that are in power don't believe we're as important as they are. And so well, it's not as important to keep us healthy. We have to fight for it. So you can hear why I'm, I just needed a book to do this. You needed a platform. I did, I yeah. did. And, and so, Another technical decision that we had to make as we developed this platform to stand on uh, was do you write the book as a series of standalone chapters, like Kathy mentioned, mm -hmm. the science chapter or the sex chapter or the relationship chapter. The sex chapter is amazing, so you'll oh. love that. Oh, it was so good. Yes. <laughs> uh, do, do you write it that way or do you write it as a whole, a, a book? And 
we started writing chapters. Because I thought women don't have time to read a book front to back, and there are different things. If you can look at your symptom and find out where it ties in, then you may be going to another part of the book to read it. However, that didn't feel very good when we read the whole thing together. It wasn't a good feel. And we forgot to say, in the middle of all this, we found ourselves a real author. <laughs> I mean, like someone who's written many, many, many books and has, and we hired him. I hired him mm -hmm. to be our, not ghostwriter, but to look at everything we did and say, nope, that's not going to play, or yes, it is, and then help us find an agent and a publisher. So Yeah, we hired he, Tim Noonan, and, yeah. and Tim ha has a unique skill, and he's worked with us, as he has worked with many other people, to help them bring their idea to fruition in a complete book. But working him into the loop, because he, he lives in the Carolinas, and mm -hmm. what thank God for the Internet, because what began to happen is Kathy and I would meet here at the office. We would have conversations like you're watching now, where, where things mm -hmm. just spew out, and then you have to try <laughs> to figure, how do I condense that to a paragraph? or five or 12 and have it flow. Mm -hmm. So then we would work on that a little bit here and then I would go home and I would work on it and then I would email it to Kathy and she would work on it and we would get it where we thought it spoke. Then we would send it to Tim and Tim would look at it and go, oh my God. And Tim you know, helped us with grammar, with structure, <laughs> with uh, framing, physically framing it on a page. Plus he's not a doctor Redundancy. and he, he yeah. doesn't know all the things we know about about medicine right. and counseling, right. he doesn't know the psychology uh, standpoint from your perspective because right. there's a lot of that in the book, and he doesn't know the medical standpoint. So he was perfect. He was the perfect guinea sort pig of blank slate to, to read, read it, it. because yeah. he's like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's really amazing. But then he'd say, Oh yeah, that that's not clear. Yeah. I don't get it. People aren't going to believe this. You, know, there, you need more substance here. And no matter how true it is, if you don't write it so that everyone will believe what you're saying, it could be it could be right in front of you and no one will believe it. So you have to write it so that everyone understands enough to believe it. So, so Tim helped us work through in our chapter by chapter by chapter phase and to begin to outline uh, where we were going with this because again initially we're just putting down pages of stuff and, and we figured when we get to the end we'll be done and books it don't organize that themselves that way. No well, they, yeah. they don't but it was like a lecture, a lecture about insomnia, a lecture yeah. about low libido and, and how hormones apply right. to that. So, so as we got close to the end of just accumulating the segmented chapters then Tim, Tim helped us come up with a, uh, a table of contents and uh, packaging of materials to send to an agent to try to acquire a real literary agent. And then the, Tim and the agent helped us take that same information and package it to send to publishers. We could never, we could never, it is such a complicated system. It's just like you can't figure out how to admit somebody to the hospital unless you're really a doctor because there's so many stages. Yes. So many steps. You can't figure out how to get your book published unless you publish it yourself, which doesn't speak to everyone and doesn't get to everyone because you need a great publisher, and we found right. one. The delivery system. We found Hay House, and Hay House is an amazing publisher. I couldn't have found a better one. Yeah. So, so, But Tim first helped us do the queries. I didn't know what a query was. Do all of these different steps that are required by agents and publishers. And then we sent them out. And then we got a response pretty quickly mm -hmm. from our our now agent, who is, who's awesome. His name is Rick Broadhead. And he's yeah. from Toronto. Right. I, and, and it was so funny. We, we talked to him on the phone. We emailed him. And I said, you know, this is great. And I think you're the man. You know, I think you're the guy. But I can't really decide until I meet you face to face. Mm -hmm. So we all flew up to Toronto mm -hmm. to meet Rick. And they had to close, we met at a restaurant. They had to close the, the restaurant around us because we weren't leaving. We were there for like six hours. Well, but what we happens? We had so much to talk about and he was so amazing. What happens and what we hope happens for you if you get this book and read it is conversations begin. And people start to tell stories, and people start to ask questions, and then there's information. And, and so we hope you do that with your friends and family, but we also hope you do that with your physicians. And mm -hmm. it takes on a life of its own, because the message of this is so important to women, and because women are so important to all of us, 
to, to the rest of us uh, about how do you want to live your life? What do you want the quality of your life to be as you age and, and you're no longer focused on having or raising children or beginning a business and having and raising children? Uh, in the fullness of your life, mm -hmm. how do you want it to be? Even when our children are teenagers. So we were having those conversations with, with Tim and Rick and you and I in Toronto, but we also then had them with the publisher and, and we're continuing to have that mm -hmm. kind of dialogue. And, and as a result of the reality of those conversations, we also then began to pull all that information into our podcast. Right. And if you are watching this now, you know you are aware of our podcast, mm -hmm. And if you go back, for, for instance, when we were writing the section, uh, the chapter on sex, which is a good chapter, we, we did five podcasts in a row on orgasm uh, because we were really absorbed in the research and the information and the importance of the information. And the information is contrary to what people believe. So yeah. we had to have a lot of backup for everything. Right. And so we had to have, we had to, I've talked to the expert you know, some of the right. experts that do the research on, uh, on orgasm and women's sexuality. Yeah. And, I mean, we had to have that information, but we wanted to share it with you as we were writing the chapter. Right. So, in the more detailed explanation is in the book. You can watch the podcast for the 20-minute version. The, uh, the whole book's not in podcast. But no. But several chapters we had to talk about because you couldn't put it all in writing. So it has been a fascinating journey, and we are really excited about working with the publisher to get it into a, a concrete item that will be in bookstores near you soon. But we don't know how soon soon is. Uh, but we're, we're in, the, in the process of that. What you can do, if you're interested, is you can go to the website and register. There's, a, there's a, a link to put your email address on it so that when the book is ready for publication you can pre-order it or you can subscribe and get an, a mm -hmm. copy of it uh, through Kathy's website as well as from bookstores around the country. And the, the drkathymoppin.com is where mm -hmm. we have it currently. So you can sign up at that site and then we will send you the information on publishing when we know when the publishing date is. Yeah. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. Follow Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Brett Newcomb can be found at brettnewcomb.com.